for you. Annie. Hi everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Art Museum. This is the wonderful exhibition that is currently on view at the Miami University Art Museum. And this was part of our capstone program in art history where students every fall curate an original exhibition um, of objects in the museum's collection. And um, they do all the research, they do all of the, um, they do all of the wall text, they do all of the development for that. And then it's up in the spring. So uh, related to that, we do programming around the show. So this show is called Confronting Greatness, a Celebration of Women Artists. And it is um, centered around this question that was posed by Linda Nochlin in 1971, why have there been no great women artists? An intentionally provocative question. And one that uh, very much the artists in our show, uh, you know, address and challenge and complicate in a lot of interesting ways. So what we wanted to do for this panel was to expand the conversation that we're exploring from our historical perspective in the show um, to start to think about um, the art world from a practical perspective, from art making and art collecting. So uh, we have a, some really great panelists from our community. And um, I want to apologize. I did not realize that I was going to be introducing you. Um, so I will introduce you based on how I know you and uh, what I know of you. So I'm really sorry that I don't have like specific things that you wanted to say. Um, but um, so we have uh, professors Jimmy Chung and Tracy Featherstone, um, both of whom are associate professors in the uh, Department of Art and who are tremendous artists in their own right. And they'll be talking about their work and their experience in the art world. And we're also very pleased to have Sarah Vance Waddell, who is a Cincinnati-based art collector and activist who has a tremendous collection of contemporary art, um, really focusing specifically on women artists and really seeing collection as a form of activism. And we are very fortunate to have three objects from her collection, including Carolee Schneemann's very important work, um, Interior Scroll, in our exhibition. So I think that I want tonight to be a little bit conversational. I have some questions that I have developed for um, kind of getting the conversation going, but I really want them to do most of the talking and I really want to engage the audience as much as possible. So if you have any questions at any time, don't feel like you have to wait to the end, go ahead and just populate the q and I'll be looking at it the whole time and I'll try to you know, select the questions in a way that uh, flows most naturally, if that makes sense. So great. Um, is there anything that the panelists would like to say um, before we get started? And I'm really sorry I didn't have the formal introduction. It just slipped my mind from teaching today. Sorry about that. Um, so great. So I think one of the questions that I kind of wanted to kind of kick off since now um, all of you have seen the show, uh, maybe we'll ask this first, which is kind of what, um, what artworks in this show are your favorites and why, how do they connect to maybe where you like how do they connect to issues that are important to you as an artist or as a collector or just as an art viewer anybody jump in or how do you yeah let, let's go let's go sarah tracy jimmy and then i'll pick a different order the next time okay as nobody was saying anything i didn't want there to be all this silence that's 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 awkward um, hi everybody, I'm Sarah. Um, it's great to be here tonight. I was very excited to be able to loan some work um, to the museum for this really amazing show. I got to see it this week and the students, Annie, you guys did a bang up job um, curating it. Um, I wish more institutions would curate more uh, exhibitions like this one that focused on women. That would be awesome. Um, so, uh, Obviously, some of the favorites of my uh, in there are obviously some things I loaned you, but I'm not even going to say that because I'm going <laughs> to. That's a given. So I have to say, and you're going to help me out on the name of the artist. It's the piece I can see behind you, Annie, the one with the royal family. That is by Marisol. Okay, that really just did something to me because it kind of reminds me of the kind of art I collect because it's a little edgy, and especially for when it was done. I mean, it was done in the 1960s, correct? So that's a long time ago. And, and basically I think she's kind of, you know, poking a little bit of fun at the Royal family and not really meaning to, but I think that's part of me, what, what's going on there. And there's just something about that piece. It's just cause it's sculptural. It just kind of lifted itself, you know, away from the space. Um, I really like the way how she um, interpreted 
the family. Um, I think she did a bang up job with that. And I think probably other than the, some of the other work that I loaned, that's probably one of my favorite pieces in that show. Hi, thank you, Sarah, for loaning those pieces. That was really cool to see it. And thank you, Annie, for organizing. Thank you, Art Museum, for asking us to come talk. Um, I, uh, I wish I was in the gallery, but the piece that keeps on standing out for me is the Miriam Shapiro quilt um, of Frida Kahlo, because I just felt like it was another woman artist recontextually recontextualizing an, another female art. Like it was like sort of speaking of a lineage and I was using material in a way that was uh, associated, you know, um, with sort of women's work, but doing it in a way that really sort of bolstered up um, the history of uh, female artists. So I guess that's probably what, that's the piece that was like, I felt like I really stopped in front of for a long time, but there's lots of really good stuff in there I could go on, but I think that's my, um, <laughs> my, my one answer for that. Well, um, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, panel discussion. And uh, I had really amazing time on Friday afternoon, looking, uh, walking through the gallery and seeing every work and, um, you know, having, you know, uh, this moment of, wow, I forgot about this, you know, uh, actual experience of the artwork <laughs> since the pandemic began. Um, while I have uh, several favorites, uh, I really like uh, Marie, uh, Marisol Escobar, The Royal Family, uh, Anne Hamilton's uh, book, Wait TT, uh, which I think I was kind of, I got more of uh, insight when um, Annie's student uh, who curated uh, this piece uh, for the show showed different, you know, aspects of uh, how this photograph came up uh, with the, you know, books hanging from the ceiling and having this heavy structure holding the books. Uh, I kind of I like both the uh, photographs as well as uh, the actual installation to take the photographs. Uh, definitely Carol Schneeman interior scroll is, you know, every time I, I see this piece, uh, either, you know, uh, through uh, reproductions or actual work, which is I'm, I feel so fortunate to see in person, uh, gives me a chill. You know, it feels like uh, the piece is just um, embodying the moment of um, actual performance uh, through the stains and, you know, all these torn papers and uh, at the edges of the, uh, the scroll. Um, and so that's kind of a, something that holds lots of uh, intense experience. And uh, I, uh, another piece that I liked a lot is uh, Kiki Smith, uh, Come Away From Her uh, after Lewis Carroll. And um, uh, the reason is uh, first, uh, it's scale being a print. Um, I, I didn't know that it could be that huge <laughs> piece uh, being a print, right? Uh, kind of a, you have these uh, uh, limitations uh, because of all this process that goes into, but uh, the scale uh, was uh, really attractive to me. It just absorbed me. Um, uh, I like the, uh, the the colors that went in for the um, you know that cer light cerulean uh, blue sky and then fine uh, needle tip you know that dry point marks lots of them create this uh, sense of resonance uh, and then I get uh, you know when you look at the, um, uh, the that flatness of the uh, surface uh, contrasting against these uh, layers of mark making I think that there is some quality that uh, uh, has uh, transformative quality and um, I kind of uh, think about this as uh, in terms of animation sort of because I'm kind of into that uh, and I can see you know those um, the birds with the uh, uh, what is this um, the, the uh, wolf um, flying away from the picture plane and um, you know there is some kind of uh, animated quality to the work so that was my take on the uh, uh, my favorite pieces. Oh, wonderful. So hopefully that, you know, gets people really interested to go see the piece. So, I mean, as you can hear from um, their, their responses, there's kind of a wide variety of work in the show. And I think that, you know, speaks to the wide variety of um, avenues that we can 
go down with this conversation. So I'll start with John, another general question. Um, and maybe this time we'll go Jimmy, Tracy, Sarah, and then we'll mix it uh, up next time, um, which is just, you know, have you seen over the course of your career, uh, your education, your time collecting, um, how have you seen the position of women in art? Uh, how, how have you seen the position of women in the art world change over this time? So, I mean, how have you seen or how have you not seen um, these issues arise in different ways or not arise? Um, you know, you can kind of go a lot of way, a lot of you know directions with this, but I think that uh, it's important, especially for a lot of students in the audience. I think to be aware of um, you know very recent history as well. So I you know would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, uh, well, that's a tough question because, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in looking into all these kind of uh, big changes in the art world, um, you know, but uh, from my perspective as a mid-career woman artist, minority artist, sort of feeling like uh, being at the edge of the art world, <laughs> uh, uh, I feel like um, there is uh, more inclusion of women artists in the exhibitions and collections, and also I see increased number of um, uh, women professionals in various uh, leadership positions uh, in, in the art world. Um, and I'm kind of thinking about, let's say, you know, when we look at uh, Cincinnati, uh, like a contemporary art center uh, has a female director and chief curator. And uh, like Cincinnati Art Museum has uh, out of eight curators, uh, six are female curators, which I think I kind of, I think that's quite significant. Uh, and also I think there are more opportunities for women artists, um, but uh, the limits, limitations I think is that uh, many of these exhibition venues uh, for emerging and uh, mid-career artists who are not, you know, like blue chip artists connected, well connected to the galleries, still have uh, limited venues. Uh, and most of them are somewhat nonprofit alternative spaces or educational environment like university galleries. Uh, for temporary exhibitions, which is great, and uh, it offers lots of experimental uh, ground, but uh, it's it, it kind of uh, I wish there was more linkage um, to you know go to the next step of uh, let's say how can I get uh, establish my career in the uh, or get into the actual art market. So. Um, but uh, I kind of see more opportunities in the US uh, than, for instance, uh, countries like um, Korea, where I came from originally. Um, when I was a student there uh, in 1995, 90, uh, to 2000, I was in uh, Seoul. And I attended this uh, art program, which is very prestigious. Um, and uh, I would say competing top two uh, art institutions in Korea. And 80% uh, of the students were women, uh, female students, and the rest, you know, only 20% are male students. But uh, when you look at the faculty body, uh, only there was only one female faculty <laughs> in the entire studio art uh, area um, department. Uh, and I try to I try to see if anything changed. So I kind of uh, get back to my you know the school and see. And there are two now <laughs> tenure track faculty, women faculty, and the rest are like lecturers, uh, temporary positions. So I I would say there are still you know kind of a leading positions or influential positions are pretty much uh, dominated by uh, men. So I uh, wish there was more uh, presence of women, uh, but I guess that's something that um, goes with uh, what happens in the uh, society in a larger sense, right? I'm going to jump in real quick uh, because uh, in my haste and in, in my complete negligence to make a... Uh, a introduction for our panelists. I accidentally lumped people together, and since it's so important to talk about uh, women's positions in the academy, uh, Tracy, uh, uh, Professor Featherstone is full professor. I, I misspoke about your title, so I apologize. And I think it's just important if we have these conversations about women's role in the academy that we uh, honor when people, you know, do a, you know, ex ex uh, excel in advance. So anyway, so I apologize for that. That was my bad. Well, thank you. Now it's just gotten more recognition. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, just to get back to the question, um, the thing I was thinking of, um, 
I totally agree with Jumi. Uh, I think she said a lot of really good things. I think that first popped into my mind when Annie asked the, or uh, Dr. Delaria asked the question was, um, I feel like when uh, art, art uh, women's uh, art gets written about more, criti more critical attention than it used to. That's the big thing I really noticed from being in school till present. Like, I feel like the artists that were getting written about like back in the nineties when I was in school were artists that were doing, uh, women artists that were doing like real sort of inflammatory things all the time. You know, it was like, they were out there pushing the limits and they were getting written about because they were, um, you know, like sort of intentionally, like I'm thinking of, um, oh, uh, you know, doing, uber sexualized art and things like that because they were getting sensationalized. And so they would get written about that, but now, and then people just sort of doing other things that were less sensational or whatever, just were off the map. So they were sort of put on this pedestal as like a, you know, a sideshow act or something. And, um, I feel like the writing has really changed and there's a lot more writing about, women making all kinds of art. Um, you know, if you open any of the like art news or art in America and things like that, or if you go on to hyperallergic, you can read about, you know, a good amount of women making art in a serious way. Like not, in, it, the, I'm not against sensationalist art. I'm just saying that was the only thing that was getting writ written about in the nineties. And now it's, there's a good survey of things. Um, I think from my perspective, I come um, with a different perspective because I'm not um, an ac academic um, like my other panelists members are. Um, I'm an art collector. I've been collecting for over 23 years. Um, when I first started, I was very eclectic. I was all over the board. I collected um, a lot of artists I researched that I felt were bigger names. Uh, I was collecting artists like Marc Chagall. Uh, Damien Hurst, Louise Bourgeois, Kiki Smith, um, and I didn't have a focus. And as I kept collecting more and more, and I started getting involved with organizations like the Art Museum, the Contemporary Art Center, other uh, museums across the country, I started to realize that women artists and artists of color were not being recognized like white male artists. They weren't being represented like white male artists. Uh, the, the auction results at, at um, auctions, um, more money was being, was going, went to male artists over the female artists. So I probably, you know, about 15 years ago, made a decision that it was time I did something to, I could do to right or wrong. And that's, I was going to focus on collecting only art by women and artists of color. Um, you know, things have changed. Is, is it still a, man's world. Yes, unfortunately, I think it is. Um, has it gotten better? Okay, things have changed in the last 20 some years I've been collecting. It just in the past year, yeah, last year, 2020, it was 100 years, the women's right to vote. And a lot of institutions all over the country, all over the world started doing a lot of things to honor women. And there were institutions like the Baltimore Museum that decided, hey, for year 2020, we're only going to acquire art by women artists. And that's it. And that's great. But my thing is, are you going to continue doing that? It's great that you did it in 2020. So what's going to happen now in 2021 and 2022? Um, I think a stand has been made for women artists, but I think we have a lot of room and to go. I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, is it better than it was? Yes, but um, we still have a long, long way to go. And um, I just want to do my part as a collector to help facilitate that. Great, thanks. Um, I might jump, I'm going to jump around in my question list just because there were some questions or some comments about like art school to now. And I think that um, one of the things that I'm always curious about is kind of what people are exposed to in their education. And, um, and I think about that a lot as a teacher too, in terms of what I'm exposing people to. So I'm curious, uh, maybe for Jimmy and Tracy, for this question, in the course of your education, um, were the artists you introduced to inclusive of women artists, um, of artists of color or of queer voices? Like, were these things that you were exposed to in art school? Um, and, you know, to what extent? I mean, I think, you know, that it's just, you know, 
you know, all these things are systemic, right? So um, I felt like my professors uh, tried to expose me to a broad range of things, but they were taught by, you know, sort of white binary, you know, <laughs> uh, men themselves. So I did have um, a really strong female role model, but in multiple, and then graduate school, actually multiple. Um, so maybe that made a huge difference. And, um, but I do think like, so because I grew up, well, I was going to school in the nineties and early two thousands, um, that the AIDS epidemic was really going on. So that really, um, featured, you know, queer voices in a way that they were forefronted. And I think, um, you know, at some point that backslid or something, <laughs> because I felt like we talked about it more when I was younger. And then there was, I mean, of course now it's very prevalent. Um, but there was like a period where I don't think that, you know, queer voices were heard at all. Um, so um, maybe going back to how I was talking about sensationalizing sexuality too. I mean, I think that was a big part of it. Um, so no, I don't think, you know, and I think this it, too, I always think, am I expo giving enough exposure to all these things to my students or at least helping them find it? Like I try to be really conscious about that. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. I'm, it, sure, it certainly wasn't a hundred percent inclusive, but I, it was more than I had ever seen growing up in a really conservative family. So, I mean, I can give that to them. Like, yeah, they broadened my horizons enough that I knew that I could look for more. How about that? <laughs> well, I, my experience is based on my, you know, education in South Korea, in Seoul. Um, I uh, went to Hongik University, which is kind of, uh, you know, quite um, one of the top two competing in Seoul. And um, uh, many, you know, who graduate from there are directly, you know, getting into the field, you know, as curators or artists. Uh, not many, actually, only 2% <laughs> of each generation survives as some kind of professional in art. Uh, the rest, you know, find other jobs because uh, the market is really small there or none at that time. Uh, but uh, in terms of education, um, I didn't have that much of exposure, almost nothing when I was at undergraduate uh, school, uh, undergraduate uh, program. Uh, and, but I had an opportunity to uh, really delve into uh, contemporary art theory through this graduate certificate program. And that was taught by a, um, a, a female, uh, lecturer uh, uh, sort of, uh, and she was actually the uh, director of a newly opening um, uh, museum or art center in Seoul. And so she was kind of, her perspective was really uh, fresh and uh, providing all the, you know, kind of what's going on now in the art world and what are the issues and, you know, the talk about gender, uh, talk about race and, um, um, and so that was kind of uh, my exposure to uh, at least the, some uh, theoretical part. And then um, I think the, uh, the, the, there are a couple of women artists that I, you know, that kind of influenced uh, in my, you know, perception about the art world and as well as the formation of my work. Um, Louise Bourgeois was one. Uh, there was a huge retrospective show at the uh, Contemporary Art uh, Museum in, um, Quachon, which is a little close, you know, for about an hour, an hour from Seoul. And uh, that was kind of a really mind blowing exhibition, that kind of a retrospective. So it has all kinds of <laughs> works that she produced. Um, so prints and installations, uh, the spider and everything. And then uh, the other women artists was kind of a Korean version of um, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, <laughs> Chun Gyeongja is her name, and she kind of had all this kind of a more, you know, flowers and more feminine uh, artwork, and that was kind of, uh, you know, uh, you kind of see, well, you can do that too, and uh, you can be considered as artists, you know, flowers. <laughs> so that was kind of a, a, my, you know, experience of uh, uh, women artwork, uh, artists works uh, in my undergraduate, and then the, my graduate school in the U.S. was uh, much more, uh, you know, more exposed to these different uh, voices. 
That's, I, I'm like seeing like Louise Bourgeois in that painting behind you. And <laughs> I'm like seeing it. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think, well, a question from the audience that is actually one of the ones I was going to ask too. So I think we'll do that one first. There's actually a few coming in from the audience. Um, and this one is kind of what artist is most inspiring to you and why? And I think this is one of the questions that I had for all three of you is, um, you know, which women artists do you find most inspiring and why? And I think, you know, um, you know, this could go in a lot of directions. And I think that's perhaps one of the things that I hope happens. So yeah, uh, maybe we'll have Sarah and then Jimmy and Tracy. Um, there are a lot, and I can't believe you're making me just choose one, but I'm going to pick two because one is a national artist who everyone, most everyone knows or should know about, and one's a local artist who all of you may know or may not know. So the first artist that has inspired me, uh, Carly Steeman. Um, you know, when I first learned about her, gosh, it was like 20, 22 years ago. So it was early in my collecting that I started to learn about Carol Lee. I saw her in a show at uh, WAC at PS1 a long time ago. Um, so I started learning about her. And as I got into learning about Carol Lee and I realized that she was just, she was a feminist through and through. She she's historical. Um, she's not only a great artist, but she you know does video work. She does painting. She does sculpture. Carol Lee is all over the place, and she was ahead of her time. And uh, you know I can't say that about a lot of artists that I have in my collection, but I can say that she definitely was ahead of her time. Uh, trailblazer. Uh, till this day, you know when I make talks and I talk about the interior scroll, people are like, oh my god, and then. I always love to introduce people to interior scroll. And if they don't know about it, I'd like to tell them about it. And then I, as you can imagine, I get all kinds of like, what are you, what are you talking about? So um, that's pretty cool. And another one that I really think is uh, amazing is her name is Dr. Carolyn Mizlumi. And she lives actually in Cincinnati, Westchester area. She started the Women of Color Quilting Network. She's a curator, a writer, artist. Um, she does a lot of work with trying to get more women, young women, black women into quilting to carry on this ancestral art that's starting to die down because a lot of women in her network are 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. They're dying off and she's concerned what's going to happen to the history of black women and their quilting and whatnot. So I really like where she's going because she does a lot of things with race relations. She just did a big exhibition, uh, curated a big exhibition in Minneapolis where George Floyd was murdered about George Floyd and all her artists kind of got in together and did a montage to um, memorialize George Floyd. And it's just, you know, I think both she and Carol Lee are just, they're both historical in their own right. And one talks about feminism and one talks about race relations. And I just like, the, the dialogue that both of them have. Is that my turn? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, my, um, the artists that inspire me, you know, you can see in my work too, <laughs> are, I'm naturally driven to installation artists. So, uh, well, the first impact was Julie, Mech uh, sorry, um, <laughs> Louise Bourgeois, which, uh, who I already mentioned. Uh, and um, the next person is Julie Mehretu. Uh, and uh, I like her work because um, her scale, her, uh, you know, it's like, you can see it as drawing, but also as an installation. And uh, I really get mesmerized by the layers and layers of marks and different kinds of system compiled together. And, um, and, you know, and, and, and then I kind of uh, see how she can do this, like a huge scale, and she's navigating through her work, and she's immersing into the work. And uh, me as a viewer, uh, I, uh, I get really, uh, I have really a strong reaction when I see uh, works that create a, a space uh, that I am walking in or walking around. So Julie Mehretu's work does that for me. Uh, Tara Donovan is another artist who I, whose work I saw at um, the uh, Contemporary Art Center some years ago. Um, and Pippi Lottie Reist, uh, the video artist, uh, her work, um, Pixel Forest was in particular uh, really uh, amazing experience. Uh, the video that travels through 
uh, seamlessly travel through different perspective and different locations. Uh, at some point it's above the water, it's inside submerged and then gets close to the, the plant and gets inside the plant <laughs> and navigates through the cell system and then comes out and then goes, um, jumps to satellite view. But all that uh, change of perspectives um, happens so smoothly that you don't know when is the point where point of transition um, and I can keep, <laughs> keep going on, but a um, couple of artists that um, uh, I like because of their conceptual approach and also their formal solution are Janine Anthony and Mona Hatton. And, um, you know, they deal with all these uh, heavy issues, cultural, race, uh, political issues, but, um, but uh, it's the, I get the message, but also the work itself because of their formal uh, aspect of their work um, drives me to this uh, tra transformative experience. Hi, um, I tend to, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't just pick any of that question or Dr. Delaria, that question was very unfair, but I am like just going to the artists I think about, I keep on referencing to my students. So it must mean that I'm like geeking out on them right now. <laughs> um, so like I, um, found this book by uh, Charlene Van Hale that I just really love. I actually checked it out from the library and I'm not returning it because I can't find a copy for myself. But um, she just had a show this summer, I think, or last at the Hirshhorn that I didn't get a chance to see. But um, just really, oh, yeah, we can go, we can go talk. That'll be the second talk. So um, I just really love her work, um, the improvisation and the sort of looseness and the way she thinks about painting or it, also she does prints, a lot of prints um, as like just this idea of trying to create something a little uncomfortable or new or something, you know, this, I really like, I tend to gravitate to artists that sort of like that idea of awkward awkwardness like it doesn't quite hold together there's something questioning its existence or something like that um so I think she just hits it on the head pretty good a lot of times and then so the other artists I kind of want to reference that do that is um Arlene Sheckett who is a ceramics artist um and also um person I keep on um sending to all the printmakers is Tomashi Jackson and she's doing like prints on all these alternative um, surfaces and talks about civil rights and um, prints that pr the actual print images are like of um, sort of protest marches, um, you know, historical protest marches along with really contemporary materials that she often hangs together and sort of collages together in a weird, like I'm gonna say quilt, but it's not really quilt. It's and it's dimensional, sometimes just hanging. There is sometimes stitching and sometimes collage and print things. Um, and I think I get really pulled in by the tactility of the piece and how she's sort of, um, it also has this, um, thing about it that kind of barely it's like barely hanging together it's like this concavity of things happening <laughs> and so but then I also um, like how she's referencing these historical images and bringing them back to contemporary times because it's still part it's still a huge part of the conversation so she has an ability like with color and materials to bring this thing we were talking about you know years ago back to our faces like it's not gone away yet you know it's not it's still here That's great. So I think maybe building off of that, since we're kind of learning about your inspirations, could you maybe tell us a little bit about how maybe, um, if at all, and if the answer can be no, uh, you explore issues of gender identity into your practice at any point? Has that happened with you as artists? And maybe this question for Jimmy and Tracy, and then I have a separate one for, for Sarah. So how have these kind of issues of of gender or identity, how have they entered into your practice at all? And that can be in terms of process or subject matter or conceptual approach, you know, you, you name it. I think I would love for you to talk a little bit, bit about your work. Okay, uh, well, um, well, I don't think my work is kind of a forefront uh, dealing with uh, issues of ident identity or gender, but Definitely those topics come across my work in a more, you know, kind of embedded way. Um, but I'm kind of thinking about, you know, for like 
uh, it's quite in interesting. This all this um, pre preparing for this panel discussion made me think about my work, reflect more about my work, and uh, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm kind of a woman artist, um, uh, color <laughs> of color, uh, minority uh, immigrant. Uh, I uh, my first uh, experience as an immigrant in Western culture was in Argentina when I was 12 year old, uh, and I went through lots of uh, different, you know, kind of uh, difficulties and, uh, you know, what my life could be <laughs> kind of a, uh, an interesting subject matter for my work, uh, which I kind of uh, keep thinking about, but kind of uh, trying to find an entry point into it. Maybe animation could be a good, um, you know, place to start that. But, uh, and then the, my second experience that as immigrant is here in the US uh, and uh, my position is much, much different than uh, being in Argentina, um, which was a very much, you know, you are an immigrant uh, in a very vulnerable position. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's uh, even a luxury to think about, uh, you know, developing your own career. It was just a total, you know, survival uh, from, you know, the very you know, language, uh, culture bar barrier and all that. So, um, and there is a lot of my personal stories that, <laughs> that kind of gets uh, somewhat difficult for me to get at. And uh, I feel like I need to find some good formal, uh, you know, form or, you know, means of exploring it deeply and so I don't end up, you know, using it as, um, you know, just a surface illustration of uh, my life, <laughs> which would get quite comical and which is not. <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of thinking about it, but uh, at the moment, my works are more kind of geared towards, you know, something that uh, I guess it's not directly reflecting the idea of identity or having my life as a, as a subject. Uh, I kind of think about it as a sort of, maybe I'm doing it as a refuge <laughs> for me to, you know, like life is so hard. I need <laughs> something else to, to focus on and hold on to. <laughs> so I think my answer has to, about identity um, has sort of goes back to this idea of craft. Um, I, there's kind of two things I want to say about that. I think I was like, when I started art school, it was a big, and I don't, this doesn't seem so prevalent now, but when I started art school, it was a big deal, a big splice between craft and fine art. And I really got like, um, I really got harassed or I don't know what shut down anytime I wanted to use materials that I found familiar to me. Because like, so if I wanted to use textile or I wanted to use, you know, even kind of clay or paper mache or molding things like, because it was what I was familiar with. I mean, it, it was what I knew growing up and um, it, the, I always got really slammed in critiques because it was like too crafty, which was a bad work, you know, that was bad. It was like not as high as fine art. And so um, I still use it. <laughs> It didn't work. I still use all that stuff in my work today. Um, so I think it really shows up in materials. These are materials that are really accessible to women. The things you learn how to use in the household, they're everyday objects. And um, the other way I think it kind of shows up, and I'll give an example. I was thinking about the works that Sarah has in her collection. And both of them, I kind of regularly do this. Like I got really fascinated with these boucherie rugs that are often um, made by women. And I was um, researching all these different patterns and they're kind of made with recycled materials, which I am really passionate about. And so I did the, um, I have these rug paper rug drawings is what I call them. And they um, take recycle. So they are a drawing about a rug. <laughs> and so I made, like, I sort of looked at these rugs, which are utilitarian objects, and I made a sort of dimensional drawing that has um, relief paper pieces that come out of it, but it's meant to hang on the wall like a work of art. So I'm like sort of having this clash between what is considered fine art and acceptable and what is sort of more craft and utilitarian. Um, I like to kind of, and I like to like quote artwork of other women. And so the other piece in Sarah's collection that I was thinking about is a, is a excerpt from an, a painting. Um, 
I'm blanking out on the name right now, but I took a splice of this painting by a contemporary um, female artist and made it to imagine what it would be like if it was dimensional, like a sculpture. So I sort of like to do this, the, the mix mash, I guess, <laughs> between what, you know, like looking at other uh, women's work and sort of, I regularly have this conversation about craft and fine art and how I can turn it on its head and with the materials of my work. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that kind of marginalization of women's, uh, of the marginalization of, of media traditionally associated with women is, is one of the like kind of key issues, and you know, here. And that's, that's so wonderful to hear as well. Um, so I think maybe kind of expanding on that to Sarah, I'm curious when you meet or discover new artists, I'm curious what you look for in order to build your collection, kind of, you know, thinking about this, Discuss, discussing about discussing these issues and concept of, of making art and looking at art, but now into the kind of practice of like uh, selling art or acquiring art. So I'm curious what you look for when you are kind of on the hunt for a new acquisition. Well, I, first of all, I'm on the hunt 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that doesn't stop. Um, I subscribe to, as many of you do too, a lot of arts publications online, magazines and whatnot. Uh, galleries, once they learn what you like, they start bombarding you with all kinds of artists that they represent. So what I look for is I just go with my gut and it has to be, I have to like it right off the bat. And when I look at a piece of art by an artist, um, I know within 30 seconds, if I actually know, I know within 15 seconds, if I like it well enough and I wanna acquire it and then I make it happen. Um, for me, I collect, I've been told I collect work that's difficult um, and which means, you know, I don't collect pretty things, Things that I collect talk about women's bodies, um, their political in nature, uh, talks about immigration, race relations, and especially with, you know, African-American, young African-American men getting shot, you know, all these murders and whatnot, all this is so it's been going on. This is the type of work I collect because I collect real life things, real life. That's why contemporary art is important to me. Um, and the reason I collect contemporary art is I love to get a relationship with the artist. And so when I reach out, collect an artist, I reach out to them, either Facebook or whatever, and just kind of get to know them, um, you know, find out, you know, do I buy for them directly? Do they have a gallery? They always, you know, tell me. Um, and, um, you know, I just get to know them a little bit. I do my due diligence because when I first started collecting, I did not do that. Uh, so, and that led me in places and paths of acquiring work I should never have acquired that I ended up getting rid of. Um, so it's really important for me to know the artist and that artist has to be a good person, meaning, um, you know, they have to be decent. Um, I, if they are racist, if they are mean to animals, um, I don't want to collect them. So, you know, they have to be a good, they have to be good people. Um, so that's kind of what I look for when I'm, when I'm collecting. Oh, that's a great, uh, great answer. So I'm wondering for, for Jimmy and Tracy kind of thinking, professionally about um, kind of how do you navigate any kind of, you know, complications in terms of getting shows, getting your work out there, getting seen um, and kind of, you know, how has, yeah, I don't know, I guess I'll kind of leave that open, but you know, how have these issues perhaps impacted, um, impacted your ability to get your work out into the world? Well, I, uh, I think I talked about a little bit at the beginning uh, when I was talking about, you know, kind of uh, artists, um, you know, art, emerging artists or, you know, artists like myself who, or us <laughs> who are kind of somewhat, you know, uh, distant from the actual art center. It gets quite difficult to, um, you know, connect directly with the curators or, you know, collectors uh, because you are kind of away from the art scene. Um, and so I guess uh, my major places that I look for is also because of the nature of my work. Uh, many of my works are sort of <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, some are durable, but some are, you know, kind of a not, maybe not that durable. They are temporary, they exist temporarily, or they are animations that doesn't have any monetary value <laughs> or, you know, so, 
Um, and also it is because it is installation and usually, you know, the works kind of bounce off. Uh, one work that is three-dimensional and installation bounces off, uh, you know, kind of a, it completes the experience because of the animation. And so it becomes more experimental. And so uh, probably like commercial galleries might not look at my work as something attractive to look at in first place. So there's already, you know, knocked off. <laughs> And then I'm, I, I think uh, being woman and, uh, and you know, uh, women of color, I think that is another factor that gets in the way. Um, and also the personality, you know, you have to be, you know, kind of, uh, making connections and all that. And something that uh, you have to, I guess, cultivate if it is not, if your personality is not <laughs> coming with that kind of, uh, you know, uh, personality, you know, to, to connect with people. So yeah, it, it is quite challenging, uh, but my main strategy is kind of, I look for, you know, um, uh, look for, you know, uh, uh, jury exhibitions uh, with, uh, you know, kind of a reputable jurors uh, and many occasions, in many occasions, my work get in there. And, but my, you know, concern is that, okay, when the show is over, that's it, you know, kind of now I have to move on to another opportunity and another, it almost feels like, at some point it feels like I am in the same circle, uh, circling around. Um, and then uh, uh, places like uh, university galleries are pretty good at hosting this kind of experimental works with experimental nature. Um, but, um, but I don't know, it's kind of uh, quite difficult to connect to um, galleries uh, that actually, you know, kind of uh, would do uh, long-term um, representation of the artist or connecting with the collectors. Um, but um, I think um, the, uh, I guess I'm jumping into maybe next topic, but um, the, I'm kind of uh, thinking about the open source that uh, Annie, you were part of it and uh, Sarah was also, you know, as, as collector connecting, bringing in uh, different artists that you know, and the uh, different cur curators in the area, bring in different artists. And I thought that that was a great um, platform where uh, artists are exposed to much greater uh, audience and uh, potential curators or collectors who might be interested in your work. So yeah, uh, I wish there was more of that kind of um, um, events or, or platform where, uh, uh, artists who are less known and uh, more marginalized have more opportunity to uh, get their works out there. Um, so the prof professional challenges because being a woman is kind of the question. I'm just like trying to think, you know, sometimes I don't like, I don't know if I know how to answer this question because <laughs> you can't like always separate it out. You know, I think Jimmy's response was like really accurate. Um, I think the, the thing that um, I think, yeah, I think I have limited opportunities and clearly I'm less representing, represented in collections because if you look at just the proportion of people identifying as female versus male and, you know, collections except for Sarah's, <laughs> um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's hard to mark up the reason wh why or why not that is. I think one of, I've talked to other um, women artists that um, are hesitant to apply for exhibitions and stuff that are for specifically women artists. And this was in one of the panels in the show talking about like, why am I called a woman artist and why is my male colleague just called an artist. <laughs> and so I think for that reason that um, there are people, I, I apply to them because I feel like, well, it's just an extra opportunity. Um, you know, I'm going to take what I can get. And I actually really love being in an exhibition. Like I like my work being in company with other women artists or artists of all, you know, of all kinds. So um, I kind of like that dialogue. So I apply, but I know um, other people that I've talked to or worked with, they are really hesitant to apply to that those kind of exhibitions because they don't want to be identified as only a women artist. They want to be an artist. Um, so that would be one thing I'd bring up. Um, it it provides uh, those kind of exhibitions and things provides um, extra, you know, 
you're, you get extra opportunities and more people will see your work is the hope. Um, but at the same time, you're sort of ghettoized as being, you know, a specific kind of artist. I think that's a really important point. And, and absolutely, there are, there are a few artists in the show who, you know, explicitly rejected the title woman artist, which is why one of the themes is like woman slash artist, because this is such a tricky kind of thing to think about. And there is this kind of idea of like objectivity that's granted to men, um, but almost never granted to, to women artists. And no one is really truly objective, right? We all see the world through our own eyes. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting kind of, uh, you know, point to bring up. I think, um, let's see, well, let's take another uh, audience question, um, which is kind of building off of this. And I think this could be for all three of you, which is, um, what barrier do you think is the hardest to get past for, as a woman in the art world? Is it this kind of, you know, question of all of, you know, being limited or labeled by, by virtue of your gender or is it professional hurdles? And I mean, there are statistical analyses just like you were saying about um, major collections other than Sarah's, uh, major collections, how they're almost exclusively male and also just how, a lot of the kind of, when you look at the top selling artworks, they fetch much higher prices. Um, so there's a lot of different things here. So I'm curious, this is um, from Hannah in the audience who says, um, you know, what is the, what was the hardest and what maybe is still the hardest barrier that you think women face? And this could be for all three of us um, to answer. So. And maybe we'll go Sarah, Jimmy, maybe we'll go Sarah, Tracy, Jimmy. So I'm just going to ours. <laughs> Okay, so that sounds like more of a question for artists in general, not me, me as a collector, but sure. um, I, you know, I, I just, I want the art world to be different. I want it to be where we don't have to say, to your point, women artists, male artists, art, you're artists, you know, all the artists in my collection, all the women artists, artists of color, male artists I have in my collection, they're artists. And I don't like that there's still a tag with that, um, I like to see a time when that just goes the wayside. And when someone asks me what I collect, I can just say, you know, I, I collect art by amazing artists, and period, and leave it at that. Um, I guess one thing I, I would have to say is I would like to see, and this is kind of somewhat into relationship to your question, somewhat maybe not, is as a collector, I would love for um, other collectors to start collecting uh, more art by women and artists of color. Um, I would like uh, uh, collectors also to focus on local artists. So for me and my collection, uh, when you visit our collection and you see what the work in our collection, I have work uh, from international artists. I have work from national artists, regional artists and local artists. And right now tonight, we have two amazing artists on our panel whose work I, I adore, both of you. Um, and I feel we have so many amazing artists in Ohio and in the Cincinnati area that collectors should be really focusing on home. And my, my mother, mother always said, you know, you take care of home base first. And so I certainly try as a collector to acquire work and to uh, help support women artists that are local and male artists also. So both, both all artists that are local. So I wish more collectors would focus on local artists. I think that would be, that would be great. Me too. Thank you for starting the ball rolling, Sarah. <laughs> she, Sarah is being very modest, but she's had such a huge impact on the Cincinnati art scene. I mean, we could go on that for the whole hour or two, but um, I, you know, the thing I can, I feel like this is like really not PC to bring up, but I'm going to try to talk about it in a way that's like, <laughs> I don't know, a little more broad. Um, I feel like my biggest challenge is honestly sort of related to gender roles and professional expectations. Um, like I've had people tell me, well, you're not gonna be able to do, like be an artist and a professor and have kids. Um, and like I've outblank have people tell me that. And we know that's not true because we've seen artists, I don't know if she was a professor, but like Sally Mann and the Louise Bourgeois even back in the day, but Louise Bourgeois was talked bad about because she didn't really mother her children. <laughs> <laughs> that much. she let them free range. Um, so I, the hurdles I come through, I felt 
and I think this um, goes into academia too, like the things you have to juggle and the expectations that are placed upon you just so you can be good enough is really different than what I would say my male colleagues sort of are expected to do or what, not that I think, I actually feel like I'm in a really supportive institution and things like that. It's just that in order to get, you know, um, international shows and do all the things I had to you know, do to sort of, um, you know, get tenure and promotions. Um, like I would, I had to go to, I mean, I loved doing this, but I had to go to Czech Republic for, um, three months and build an exhibition and have the exhibition. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have kids. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have done if I had kids. Um, and you know, that kind of stresses, I think are still really those expectations of personal life, balancing personal life and professional life are really different for women than they are men. You know, the standards aren't there yet, social standards. And um, I wanna thank Miami for being very supportive of that. I'm just saying it's like institutionalized social standards everywhere that make sort of the juggling uh, 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 something like an obstacle. Well, I think my my main uh, barrier, I guess, uh, would be uh, besides the gender. I think it's uh, being minority, uh, and uh, and that's that's a huge thing. Um, I think, and in, in the, you know, for, for the past ten years, uh, I think the art galleries and uh, you know uh, places are more open to minorities and women, <laughs> but um, I think that's quite recent. Um, thing you know when you go to you know if, uh, when you submit your work if I did my work in the traditional oil painting probably I would never get any exhibition that's my kind of a because I think it is that that medium comes so much with uh, that you know kind of a so loaded with um, you know uh, kind of um, uh, with embedded in this uh, patriarchal you know kind of uh, order so Unless I make like a Jenny Savile, like a huge, <laughs> really kind of a no one did this scale, probably I will never get there. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, that which wasn't the uh, reason that I kind of uh, I'm doing what I'm doing, which is kind of a multimedia, um, mixed media and uh, multi, you know, installation work that kind of happened gradually as I, uh, after graduating, actually I had... <laughs> This uh, oil painting as, uh, is my uh, formal uh, training in my undergrad, uh, four years of oil painting from day one. <laughs> and then as soon as I graduated, uh, one, because I didn't have actual studio, you know, you, to, to paint, you know, in that traditional medium, you need to have a actual space to, to paint and, you know, <laughs> and I didn't have that. I actually didn't, suddenly I graduated and I didn't have place to live and I didn't have a place to go. And my parents were in Argentina and I am in Korea and I had to, uh, you know, just suddenly I'm <laughs> homeless. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, that's, and, but then I had this crazy idea of having, you know, I want to, I don't want to just leave this country up to, after living four years, I have to mount a show in whatever way. And in Korea, uh, there is not really a, a, maybe now there are some market uh, and the supporting artists, um, you know, some galleries, not many, uh, but they support artists and invite artists for the show. But at that time, 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, uh, the only galleries that were there were commercial galleries and you had to rent the space. And so uh, I kind of scavenged, you know, kind of I, I was bankrupt, basically. I kind of rented the space and I had six months to prepare my show. And uh, of course, you know, you're 20 year old, you don't know, you know, kind of, uh, you don't, you're not really organized. And so, you know, after committing with the gallery, I realized, okay, now let's find this space to prepare my show. And you look back all the works that you did in your undergraduate program, it's sort of worthless, like academic <laughs> thing. And, and so I <laughs> spent like six months in this weird youth, uh, the hostel, uh, and uh, half of those people who live in there actually were homeless people. <laughs> and uh, one of them was a psychopath and <laughs> sort of weird, weird environment. And uh, when, anyways, I kind of uh, uh, did this self-imposed six month residency and uh, started making this uh, installation work using all these different media. 
One, because I didn't have a studio to make the oil paint. And then the other one is because that actually gave me opportunity to uh, branch out and uh, find whatever way to move my work, uh, you know, forward. So exhibit it and then, the, you know, um, but, uh, but at that time, uh, and I guess still now, I think uh, it, the, um, you know, having a show in Korea as a woman, uh, probably there is much uh, less opportunity than, the, than uh, opportunity given to men. And then uh, here in the US, I think uh, there is more kind of opportunity, but still limited. And then I don't even think about Europe. I, I think as a minority Asian, I think there is, <laughs> there is almost no uh, way uh, unless I live there several years and start establishing more inner connections. So yeah, there are lots of um, uh, limitations in that end and then uh, just stays. And uh, you know, if I want to do something like uh, heavy stuff uh, that becomes like a physical limitations too. So, yeah. Uh, these are great. And there's really, we see a couple more coming in. I know that we're, we're at seven, maybe seven, seven o'clock. So maybe, maybe just one more question. We think, would that be all right? I know, are we, we're, I think we're supposed to end around now. So let's maybe just do one more quick one uh, from, uh, oh gosh, there's two really good ones, but I'm just going to take the one that came first uh, from Lucy, um, who asked Tracy and Jumi, as your dual role as educator and artist, how do you encourage female identifying students of your own to break these boundaries and promote artwork of their own outside of the classroom? And there's a related question by Elizabeth Grace regarding how to um, uh, reclaim these cheap art materials. Um, so maybe maybe we can address one of those or maybe one answer might have both of them, but I think that might kind of round us out and then uh, and then we'll conclude. I feel I have a, just a really, I'll be short on my answer and not dive in, but I feel like the students are teaching me sometimes because of like the um, identity spectrum that we're dealing with now, you know, um, I, I feel like a lot of our conversation hasn't reflected on that, that it's not so binary anymore. I mean, I know that the um, exhibition is, you know, sort of based on history of women's work, um, but they are teaching me how to explore identities and their work, and I encourage them to do so. So I guess when they say I'm trying to express this and this and this, I go back and sort of look at artists I know in a different lens, you know, because we just didn't really talk about the um, identity spectrum, the wide spectrum that there is there went back in the day. And so if I go back and look at some of the artworks I'm familiar with, and I get curious from what my students are teaching me about identity, I, I think I can get different reads on them and we can talk about that work and how they can push their work further using those references. Mm -hmm. So, um... I guess, um, yeah, I kind of see lots of great uh, works coming out, especially in the advanced level. Um, like I teach mostly drawing classes now and uh, they have so many, you know, they use all kinds of things, especially now that we are in pandemic. Uh, they, you know, when, when we had actual classes, always there is that standard materials to prepare. So pretty much everyone does use kind of, a, you know, the same material. But then because we are in pandemic, everyone has, on, all kinds of materials around their house <laughs> and uh, I'm seeing really interesting works and ideas coming out of this um, advanced drawing classes um, and both like animation and the, uh, the advanced drawing um, because they are you know kind of uh, and uh, I guess um, the interesting part of teaching drawing class is be, uh, that students who are taking that class come from all different areas of studio art so you see kind of a all kinds of expressions. And I see students using unconventional materials and, uh, and some of them are really good that I wouldn't be able to teach in a class setting uh, because you know when, when you are meeting with the students as a group, always there is one thing you teach and everyone learns just one thing. But then when it comes to this, uh, everyone being independent, uh, they have their own drive coming out. And uh, the, to answer the question about how to promote and move their works out, um, yeah, do what I did. Like, <laughs> if you want to do it, find a way of doing it. <laughs> you learn a lot from being, you know, kind of, uh, you, you get into trouble because you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but, but it's a great learning lesson. Um, 
I, in retrospect, I mean, I, I was really reckless, uh, you know, uh, trying to mount this show, solo show, not a group show, <laughs> solo show in a gallery. I almost killed myself just uh, out of exhaustion. But it was a great uh, way of, um, you know, kind of if I, I said, if I survive and actually mount the show, this will be my uh, milestone. <laughs> I proclaim myself an artist. I think that's also very important that uh, don't think that you're a student. And this is uh, something that I learned from my professor when I was at grad school. Uh, and he said, um, Kind of, uh, don't say that you are a student at learning to become an artist. You are an, an, an artist already. <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, you, you give that title to yourself. And, but then the implication is that you have to be responsible for that title that you give to yourself. So are you going to be a good artist or lazy artist? Uh, that's up to you. And I think you have to be proactive. And uh, the earlier that you kind of identify yourself as an artist, uh, better, you take more responsibility. And if you want to get your work out there, find the ways, you know, you, you don't need to start looking for gallery representation, <laughs> but there are lots of different ways uh, of uh, getting your work out there, right? Uh, that was, what a great, I think that's a great, you know, thing to end on, you know, you know, that, that's so, so inspirational. So thank you so much. I don't know if anyone has anything else they wanted to say to close out. Um, I just want to thank all of you for participating in this and to thank everyone in the audience for coming and to thank the museum for hosting us. I really hope that everyone can please check out the exhibition. If you have any questions about the exhibition, um, let me know or let Sherry know. And, um, you know, please do. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like we had these wonderful artists, but we didn't look at their artwork. Please do check out their websites. I put them in the chat in the chat and definitely uh, support local art and, uh, you know, see local shows whenever they're out. And thank you so much to Sarah for your generous uh, support of the art world and for, um, you know, for allowing us to see these wonderful pieces in the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, ladies. I can send a follow up to all the participants that include links to all of your websites and a reminder for our upcoming programs and a link for information to visit the exhibition. And again, thank you all for coming. It was it was very wonderful. We appreciate it. Have a great night.